Sure. Uh, it's kind of awkward to be in this room again because last time I was here, I was failing a test right over there. <laughs> uh, this is human phys, uh, nephrons, and the urinary system. I don't really remember any of that. Um, I've been a full-time student for many years. My main job is to learn. But since I started college, because I don't want to graduate with too much debt, I've also been a part-time graphic designer. And if the job of the student is to learn, then the job of the graphic designer is to take information that is complex and communicate it efficiently. About a year ago, and I'll tell you why a year in a little bit, I stopped considering my two roles as separate. I realized that the job of the graphic designer is important in the process of education. Now, why is that? I think it's because learning has to do with understanding information. And the medium through which that information is transmitted has to be designed. People, I feel like people talk about ways to improve the system all the time, but I feel like design is rarely brought up. So today I want to talk to you about how design can impact education. So uh, I want to first explain why graphic design was invented in the first place. So in the 1700s, there was a man named William Playfair who said, information that is imperfectly acquired is imperfectly retained. He describes how he once carefully investigated a table of numbers such as this one, and then upon flipping the page, realized that he could no longer remember any of it. He describes his memory of the data being like an impression upon sand that was easily brushed away. Now, Playfair believed that uh, data had to be made visually intuitive to understand. So he went on to invent the bar graph, the line graph, and the pie chart, many ways of communicating information that we take for granted today. So in this sense, graphic design isn't just a vehicle for information. It's also a scaffold for understanding. Let's try to illustrate his rule with an example. So say we want to learn about the properties of the elements that are relevant to organic chemistry. We could consult a table like this, just a list of the elements and two of their properties, electronegativity and atomic radius in alphabetical order. But we can see that in this format, it doesn't help us reason about the information. And that's because raw data needs to be made uh, needs to be given visuals and reorganized before we can start thinking about it. Now, this is the form of that table we're more familiar with, the periodic table. And actually, the periodic table is an amazing piece of graphic design. And that's because scientists, when they were first making it, they realized that certain elements had similar properties, and it made sense for them to be grouped together. So in this sense, the table was designed very deliberately to make trends in data more obvious. But I see one problem with this table. When we try to use this to try to learn about the properties of the elements, the numbers this table uses don't tell us anything impactful about what they represent. So let's zoom in on those chemicals we looked at earlier. Say we wanted to learn about the property of electronegativity. That tells us an element's ability to draw electrons closer to itself in a bond. But in the way we're used to seeing it, it's typically conveyed using a unitless number between 0.7 and 4. To someone who's learning chemistry for the first time, this can seem completely arbitrary. We can do better than this. We can represent this in a way that shows us what we're really looking at. So I thought to myself, how about we represent electronegativity with color and atomic radius with shape and size? This is what I came up with. When I was redesigning the table, I kept thinking in my head, OK, the point of the table is to facilitate comparisons between the elements. I wanted to make it more intuitive to do so. Now, the bigger the circle, the bigger the atomic radius. And the darker the shade of red, the more electronegative. I feel like with this as a teaching tool, the trends in data really come to life. So why do we have to make data more visually engaging in the first place? And this wasn't, uh, this wasn't an idea I thought about until last semester. And I'll tell you a story. So in my stats class, there was a really cute girl. And, <laughs> and I wanted to talk to her. So one day, I got a chance to sit next to her, but she was on her iPhone. So when I was waiting for a chance to say something to her, I couldn't help but notice what she was doing on her iPhone. She was on one of those uh, blue websites with a lot of pictures, like Instagram, Tumblr, or Facebook. And this is how she was browsing. She was, she was flicking her thumb so quickly, I couldn't even see what she was looking at. <laughs> And every so often, she would stop, tilt her head a little bit, and then press down on the screen, and a little heart would pop up. <laughs> and then she would continue scrolling. 
and this whole time, she didn't spend more than two seconds on any given photo. So after I saw this, I stopped thinking about the girl. <laughs> but I, I couldn't help, I couldn't stop thinking about what she was doing. And I guess that's why I'm still single. But, <laughs> but my point is, my point is, it's no longer about what we can have access to. It's about when you can look at so many things, what makes you stop. Now we can take this idea and bring it back to education. Think about how much stuff you have to look at on a given basis. Now when we compare the graphics used in education to those used by competing forms of media, such as advertisements, we can see that education is severely lacking. We know what we should be paying attention to, but there are things around us that are intentionally trying to distract us. So I guess the lesson here is, if you're a communicator of information, you have to make your data more engaging. The rules of the game have changed. Let's look at a different graphic. This is called the two by two community table. And right away we can see there's something wrong with this graphic. It's just a cloud of numbers. So I'll try to explain how this graphic should be read. So in this data set, 208 students were surveyed. Out of this 208, uh, 100 said that Emory was their first choice. And out of that 100, 33 were from Georgia and 67 were from out of state. So we see the problem here. When the way to read a table isn't immediately apparent to us, the design actually distracts us from what we should be looking at, the data. And looking at this table, I think I see two things, two ways to make this more intuitive to read. The first problem I see is that the numbers in the margin of the graph are supposed to be totals for each row or column. But the problem is the word total implies a large number, and a large number should be represented by a large space. So, but in this table, these totals are pushed to the sides, are in spaces that are very small. So in this sense, the design actually conflicts with the meaning. The second problem I see is that the table features two axes. Your eye can't look down two axes at the same time, so you get confused. Do you go across first, or do you go down first? This indecision makes it difficult to read the table. In the redesign, the total is now the largest number, and the table is organized more linearly. As you move down this table, you start at the broadest level of detail, and you, sl and you slowly split into finer and finer detail. In other words, you go through the data like a statistician would. The first table we saw is efficient. It's easy to make, but efficiency isn't always good for learning. And when we look at a table and have to keep reminding ourselves of how to read it, it's easy to make mistakes. We're not computers. So the last thing I want to talk about is kind of personal to me. I've been, I've been designing eBooks since high school until a few weeks ago. And I want to, I've been through a lot. So I want to take you through my train of thought over the years and show you what I've, what I've realized. Um, about four years ago, I joined my high school newspaper. And my strongest memory is the day when our first issue was released. Uh, our team and our advisor have worked so hard to make the paper, but I, re I remember being really shocked at seeing how apathetic my classmates were to reading it. I saw people just open it up, glance at a few photos, skim a few captions, skim a few headlines, and then close it and throw it away. And for someone who's really loved writing since he was very young, that was very painful me for me to see. But it also got me thinking, maybe people do want to read, but maybe the design of the newspaper is what is preventing them from reading it. So maybe if I change my design, I could get people to read again. And with that news perspective, I opened up the newspaper again. And this time I saw things differently. This time I saw, when I opened it up, I saw a massive wall of text that made me think reading was too much of a hassle. I saw headlines that told me exactly what a story was going to be about, so I no longer had the curiosity to read it. And I saw those things, and I wanted to do something about it. So after I left the newspaper, I decided to play around with the design in my own writing and uploading it to a website called Issue for other people to read. So the first project I worked on was a, a travelogue of a summer spent in China. And for this project, I was focusing on one idea. In my mind, when people were first opening up the newspaper, they were making an assessment of how much effort it would take to read it. So in order to minimize visual stress, I used lots of white space and low word count. And I also used thin columns of text because the eye reads faster going down than across to get people to keep reading. So the idea here is 
Two sparse pages is easier to read than one dense page. Once we start, it's hard to stop, but the hard thing to do is to start. The second project I worked on was a reflection of my, my first semester in college. And for this project, I continued the same ideas. Uh, low word count, lots of white space, thin columns of text. But I also tried two new ideas. The first idea I tried was, throughout the text, I wanted to draw attention to certain quotes. So I made it either big and bold, or I highlighted it in red. And color used too much is distracting, but just a little splash of color on each page gets you to stop flipping through and actually commit to reading. And the second thing I did was I made uh, the organization very clear. So I, I made the section headers very big, and I also uh, repeated the table contents throughout. So at any given point, the reader would know where they are in the story. My third project was a, a reflection about my relationship with my parents and my thoughts about my future, set in the context of the first lab internship I ever did. For this project, I continued the same ideas, but I also tried two new things. First, I put the table of contents right on the front cover. Next to each chapter, I put the amount of time it would take to read it. So I figured, <laughs> I figured OK, uh, time is a precious commodity, and people are risk averse. So if I told people, it won't take you 10 minutes to read it, they would be willing to give me their time. And to reinforce this idea, I put little timers on each corner. <laughs> and I put line counters throughout to keep them going. And the second thing I did was, at the end of each chapter, I put a progress bar showing people how much they read and how much was left to encourage them to keep going. <laughs> I think. I think uh, things are different now. My dad told me when he was growing up, he would skip school, he would get a slingshot, shoot at birds, he would uh, sneak over to his neighbor's house, steal watermelons. The, <laughs> the way maybe a lot of us grew up here, a lot of extracurricular classes, a lot of sports team practice, a lot of music lessons, very rapidly paced, very structured, and all day long our phones are buzzing in our pockets. So I don't think it's that hard to believe it's a little harder to engage us now. It might seem like we're going off a tangent, but now I want to bring this back to education. A lot of learning in college is done through textbooks. And for me, it was hard for me to stay engaged. I learned this the hard way when I took Gen Chem in freshman year. Rationally, I knew what was inside the book was good for me. I knew I wanted to read it, but there were, it was just so hard to focus when there were so many other things to look at. So my next project took me a year, and I took all of my ideas. I took lots of white space. I, took, I made the, more, the important things bigger. I took thin columns of text and low word count. I used color for emphasis. I used color for contrast. I used color to draw the eye. And I made a textbook out of it. This book represents to me everything that graphic design can do for education. And I think looking back on everything, the struggle that I went through to get people to read my writing is the same struggle that educators face when they try to teach. And it's the same struggle that content creators online go through when they're trying to get that girl to stop scrolling and just look at what they work so hard to make. And it's the same struggle that a chemistry professor who spent 10 years to get a PhD goes through when he tries to inspire a room full of students who already have every minute of their day planned out before they even set foot in his classroom. Most of us don't lack the capacity for hard work. Most of us don't lack talent, and we don't lack intelligence. But sometimes we do lack engagement. And I think if we want to make an idea more accessible, we have to think very carefully about the way we present it. If we want people to read our world, we have to make our world more readable. We can design something that taps into people's underlying potential. That potential is already there, but the way things are, it's often poorly utilized. And this is sad in a sense, but also really inspiring, because if you can somehow captivate that potential, then people can do amazing things. This book isn't, isn't the best it can be, and I'm going to keep working on it. But I just want, after this talk, I hope designers and educators are inspired to talk to each other, and that when talented people get together, good things can happen from here. And I'll leave you with this. A long time ago, there were many different maps of the world. 
not all of those maps withstood the test of time. The maps that we have today, the maps that have lasted in our memories, are the ones where when we looked at them, we got a better understanding of the wor what the world around us was really like. If you have better design, you can be taught better. If you have a better representation of data, then you can have a better understanding of what that data represents. And then you can have a better understanding of what the world is really like. Thank you.